One of the most frequent comments we get on the channel, particularly on our Beer Geek Blind Taste Tests, is how can you tell me what a good beer is, what a good beer isn't, when flavour is subjective? And it's a great point, but in this video, I'm going to be telling you exactly what I look for in a beer, and potentially what you look for in a beer, without even knowing it. Along the way, I'm going to explain why the whole concept of balance is basically nonsense, why our palate craves certain things, why bitterness is addictive, and ultimately, why certain beers are nearly objectively better than others. So in the 10 years that we've been running this channel, we've been to a lot of breweries and we've asked a lot of brewers a lot of questions. And about 90% of those people I've asked, in this world where everybody's making the same kinds of beers, what makes your beer stand out? And pretty much all of them have replied, well, we strive for balance. It's such a cliche you'll hear from every single brewer in the world. But what does balance actually mean? In my opinion, not a lot in the modern world. The most dominant style in the craft beer segment, the New England IPA, will never be balanced. It doesn't really matter what you do to it, it's all about the hop with maybe a little bit of yeast shining through. But it's not just modern styles that aren't really that balanced. If we go back to maybe the German Hellas, that's all about the malt, really. It's about the honeyed, biscuity, bready kind of character, maybe a little bit of yeast, maybe a little bit of hot. And if we go even further back in time, maybe back to, to, to Lambics, potentially Gers, although <clears throat> that was kind of the 19th century, that's all about the brett and all about the acidity with maybe some malt kind of character shining through. So these, these are not beer styles that are built around balance. They have a particular character that they want to create and they really go for that. Now there are some styles that are all about balance and actually we covered them last week with our video, our blind taste test, all around bitters. And that's kind of what's inspired this video because you see that style, the British bitter, is all about balance. It's about lots of caramel and bread and raisin kind of character from the malts. It's about lovely hedgerow fruits and earth and spice from the hops. And it's about getting some kind of stone fruit, juicy and also bready, yeasty kind of character. So the three main ingredients of beer uh, plus water are all in harmony there. It is a perfectly balanced style. And yet my favorite from that blind taste test, didn't win because it wasn't the perfect example of the style, because it was a little bit unbalanced, was Harvey's. So why was this my favorite, even though it didn't score highest, and even though it's not the best representation of a bitter? My explanation is structure. Now structure to me is how a beer flows across your palate. It's how it starts, how it feels in the middle, and how it finishes. And a beer can be entirely unbalanced, but it can still have structure. This to my, even though they say balance twice on the label, isn't a perfectly balanced beer. There's way more yeast and way more malt than there is hop character. And yet on the palate, it's bready and yeasty, and then it's caramel sweet and full, and then it's bitter and a little bit roasty on the finish. So you have this incredible journey, this structure that goes throughout. Now what this creates for the drinker is really important. It's a journey, right? And I know that sounds super but what I'm trying to say is there's a sense of familiarity, so you're going to feel what's coming, you're going to know what's coming, you're going to be expecting what's coming, and looking forward to what's coming, and that drives you through every sip again and again and again. But equally, it also creates a sense of adventure, of excitement, of discovering new things. Essentially, what we've got is complexity in a nice little order that our brains and our palates can understand. And I think that's what's really powerful and what some people can confused with balance. Really, it's complexity in a nice order for you. And that's what we're gonna be looking at for the rest of this video. I've got four entirely different amazing styles, none of which I would consider particularly balanced in their definitions of the style, but that create structure, create excitement, both on a psychological and a physiological level through the way that they're made, the ingredients that they've used, and the way that these beers have been structured. So let's start by taking a look at the style that nobody considers balanced and lots of people criticize and almost refuse to drink for that very reason. And that's the New England IPA. So I selected this one from Beak, one of my favorite New England IPA producers here in the UK because they insist on a bit of bitterness to their beers while also not shying away from creating huge mouthfeels through, um, through wheat and through oats and through water chemistry and huge hopping additions. Now this is their core IPA. So this is the one that they wanna get volume from. They want people to drink lots of. It's not a special, it's not there for untapped. You know, it's not there as a, you know, essentially a marketing tool to excite everyone. This is their core beer, right? And so it has to be brewed in a way that's gonna be drunk, if not by the pint, just regularly 
by people who love their beer. And there's, oh my God, I can smell that from here. Pine, pineapple, orange peel, mango, pineapple and flat, ripe flat peaches I'm supposed to get from this. It's a complex aroma, it's an alluring aroma. It's an absolute, you know, <laughs> an absolute fruit salad mess of, of an aroma, but hopefully we're gonna find some structure within this. On the palette, it's all about the Idaho 7. You've got orange peel, you've got real pithiness, zestiness coming through, which lifts it and is different to the aroma. And then on the finish, I think the Idaho 7 comes through. Again, lots of orange peel, and this time it's orange peel with lots of bitterness, grapefruit kind of bitterness, which is really, really important to a New England IPA because it finishes that journey. So many New England IPAs just die off at the end. It's just this kind of, well, flabby is the word that a lot of beer writers will use, but if you add proper amounts of bitterness, 30, 40, even 50 IBUs of bitterness, you're gonna finish with a much crisper, much cleaner beer, and you're gonna add that third element. So there we go, that sounds like a structure doesn't it? We've got juice, then we've got pithiness, and then we've got bitterness, and we've got a journey that we want to take again and again and again, even in a style that everyone says is just like fruit juice. Now I said we were going to talk about the psychological as well as the physiological in this episode, and there's a reason why we like bitterness in our beer beyond the fact that it's a great crisp way to finish a beer. And that is that evolutionary, we've built in this ability to, to taste bitterness and associate it with poison. That's a huge reason why we can taste, why we have uh, receptors on our tongues to work out taste. It's to work out what might be damaging to our bodies. And bitterness is often a sign of poison. When we drink something bitter or eat something bitter and we're not poisoned, we actually get a little hit of adrenaline. It's actually our body going, you know, that was risky. It's got its fight or, or flight kind of mode going because it's like, that could be poisonous. It's a bit like going down a roller coaster, going on a roller coaster, going over the edge, and your body's like, this isn't what we should be doing. Here's a hit of adrenaline run away. Um, now we can get addicted to that bitterness, uh, much like we do with spicy food, we, where we also get an adrenaline hit, and we can also get more tolerant of it, which is why we ended up with the bitterness arms race of the late 2000s, early 2010s. So there's lots of reasons why we might crave bitterness once our palates are attuned to them. Before we move on to the next beer, which is another classic British style of the stout, I should say on the 27th of April, we are hosting a live show with the amazing brewers from Colonel. We host a live show every single month. Uh, they're great. We talk to the brewers, we interview them, we ask questions about like, hey, why does your beer stand out? Uh, as well as getting tours and having lots of fun. And you can buy the taste along box in the link below, um, or you can go out to your local indie, indie bottle shop and grab some for yourself. Now, the stout, a great classic British style, is all about the malt. It's not necessarily a particularly balanced beer. It's the malt that shines, all the different malts that go in, all the different flavours you can get from that. And yet, particularly at stronger strengths, stronger strengths, go on Johnny, uh, we can create real sense of balance. You know, the notes that we're expecting to get from this, we're going to get caramels, raisins, figs, dates, dark chocolate, coffee, <clears throat> and in particular, we can create incredible complexity like they do in coffee which only has one ingredient they can still create lots of layers of flavor and a journey and that's what we can do with a stout <clears throat> so on on the part on the uh, aroma of this incredible beer man it's molasses figs incredible like burnt caramel and a kind of red berry coffee acidity something i'd associate with like a v60 pour of of, of a coffee but that is a really complex aroma. In fact, there, there is a structure to that because it smells really sweet to start with and then as you keep breathing in, it gets more savory. I'm picking up no hop character. There is bitterness, that's important for the structure, but there's no hop flavor aroma. I'm also picking up very little yeast character. What I've got is a gorgeous, thick, um, almost kind of foamy mouthfeel and low, like crema, like the crema of a coffee, that's exactly what it is. But also, I'm getting so much complexity from that malt. And again, it echoes the aroma. And then it starts really sweet, it's all caramels and figs, uh, almost kind of nutty, pecan kind of vibes. And then it gets more and more savory as it builds to a really roasty finish. Now, as I said, bitterness is a sign of poison. For that reason, we taste bitterness right at the end so that our brains really clock into that, that we may have consumed poison. So that roasty finish really builds, um, builds and builds throughout the palate, and that creates this journey as well. So we've got this lovely, soft, sweet, dark fruit aroma that builds to real coffee and dark chocolate and burnt 
caramel. And that's how you create structure by using lots of different molds to create that. Most of this would have been pale malt, but they've used multiple different kinds of malt to create the fruitiness, to create the coffee, to create the chocolate, and to create, you know, the really kind of, is it, what is it? It's actually kind of candied sugar kind of vibes. All of those will come from different malts, so they've created structure purely within one ingredient. So this is not a balanced beer, but it is a structured beer. So now we're going to talk about a beer style that, much like the New England IPA, is much maligned by the purists as being overly simplistic, entirely unbalanced, and, and this is my least favourite phrase in beer, the kind of beer for people that don't like beer. So this is a quick sour, right? So quick sours, they are in fact just inoculated with essentially a yoghurt culture, and then over about three days turn sour with, with, with lactic culture. So you're not going to get huge amounts of complexity from that process, but you can add in complexity, you can add structure, probably not balance given that we're at a pretty acidic pH of you know, 3 to 3.5, but we can still create really structured, interesting beers, either using that as a base or just letting it really sing. And in particular, even though this beer actually has coffee in uh, from Clemson's, uh, this is from Siren, we also have the addition of salt because it's a gosa, and that is what I want to talk to you about. So on our tongue, we have lots of different sensors that are looking for certain things. And the reason we have lots of different sensors looking for certain things is because we need to know A, what's going to poison us, and B, what nutrients we're going to be gaining uh, from this. So we, in particular, can crave, uh, we can crave salt because our body needs salt in, in moderation. So we can actually use salt to make a really drinkable structured beer because our body is already craving it, essentially. So this beer, as I say, is made with coffee, but because it's a Gosa, which is a salted beer style from Germany, we're going to have even more structure. So on the aroma, but so we've got lemon zest, we've got cranberry kind of character, we've got proper roasted coffee. No hint of salt yet. Woo! So on the palate, it, it's, it's like a squeeze of lemon. It's literally a squeeze of lemon. It fizzes on your tongue like sherbet. It's absolutely amazing and invigorating. And then you swallow and you are just, it's just salty as hell. It's, it's like, it's not quite drowning in a wave in the sea because you weren't looking, but it's pretty intensely salty. And that means that my mouth is still salivating. My body is like, yeah, give me salt, give me salt, give me salt. And it also creates that third, that third element of the journey of the beer. So we have this glorious coffee, cranberry, lemon. We then have a proper squeeze of lemon on the tongue maybe a tiny bit of sweetness from the malt, but not a huge amount. And then on the finish, it's all out a salt. Huh? Yeah. So I don't drink a lot of quick sours, it's not my favorite style, but this is absolutely delicious and beautifully structured, as I've said. But what I just want to point out as well, you know, I particularly chose a gosa because I wanted to talk about salt, but it's also important to talk about sourness as a great way to finish beers. It's why so many mixed fermentation beers feel incredibly complex, because you've got the big yeasty characters, maybe the bread, the sack, um, all of those kind of yeasts happening and creating complexity, but the real difference, the real you know, the real change that you're going to feel, particularly on your tongue, is the sourness. The flavours in up here might be all about the yeast, but the actual physiological change is going to be the acidity. And you can use sourness to finish a beer much like you can use bitterness or you can use saltiness. And it creates that third element, that final finish on the beer, that creates the structure. Otherwise, again, the beer disappears um, and it's unremarkable and it's less drinkable. And so we come to the most consumed beer style on earth, but also, again, one of the most maligned, the Pilsner. Now, Pilsners are, much like the Sours, seen as overly simplistic, um, but they're also seen as perhaps the most balanced style. You know, there's a reason that 70%, over 70% of the beer drunk around the world is <clears throat> essentially Pilsner style or terrible derivations of it. And that must be, surely, if my theory is right, that structure is what matters, these beers must be structured. So actually, I've picked a beer that's actually quite complicated, quite complex. Um, Heron uh, from Kiesman uh, in Bamberg is one of the best Pilsners in the world, um, but it has some unusual notes to it that I think create even more structure. Right, so there's, there's a lovely kind of fragrant, slightly earthy, lemony character from the hops. And that's just layered on top of just straight up honey. It, it literally just smells like a squeeze of honey underneath that. 
and that is all of the malt. So we've got a little bit of hop, and we've got an absolute megaton of, of sticky, squeezy honey. On the palate though, there's so much going on. This feels a bit like a Northern German Pilsner, which has higher bitterness, and that's part of the reason I, I, I chose this. I get notes of honey, and a brioche is a flavor of, no, I use far too much, but that, that's really what I get, like creamy, buttery, croissant -y kind of kind of vibes. But also little notes of, of pear drop, and of hay, and of slightly more kind of pastoral kind of character, which I don't get in many Pilsners, but it's here in spades, and it creates this wonderful complexity. And then we get to the finish. Lots of lovely bitterness, which a Pilsner absolutely should have, whether it's German or Czech. It's not like a Hellas, it does have bitterness to it. It is slightly more balanced as a style. And loads of lemon, earthy lemon kind of character as well. So even though this is seen as the most simple beer style on earth, even though really what we're talking about here is one kind of malt that dominates everything, there's so much else going on. The yeast character is actually big on this beer, as is the hop character. So you could argue that this beer in particular has a balance to it, but more importantly, it has that structure. So you've got these three distinct, uh, I, I, I guess, destinations that you go on the journey of this beer that make it feel bigger, bolder, more exciting, and you know, more drinkable, more diveable, inable, than just a Pilsner might be in your head. I don't know why this isn't the biggest Pilsner in the world, but it's not. And so what should we say about these big macro Pilsners that are what most people drink? It's gonna break my heart, but I'm gonna dump this and put something really quite average in my glass. See, everyone thinks that being a beer YouTuber is fun, but when you have to dump Heron Pils, it's really not. So here's some Bira Moretti, which scored fine in my Beer Geek Blind taste test. Uh, I think it came second, so we put it in the good macro where it didn't do so well. But this is a very popular, pretty quick growing macro Pilsner. So why is this the most popular beer style on earth? And why is this a growing segment of that particular style of beer? Which is adjunct lager, American lager, European pale lager. It doesn't really matter what you call it, it's an adjuncted lager. It smells entirely different. You get that kind of maize canned corn thing. Maybe a little bit of caramel, maybe there's <clears throat> not just one malt in there. But the way that they've created structure in this is we've got that creamed corn, that sweet smell. People love sweetness, people love sugar, our bodies crave sugar. It's a bit of a flaw, I think, in humanity, how much sugar we really crave. But that's there, it smells sweet and honeyed, and it smells all right. Then on the palate, it's, it's actually quite rich and it's quite full, but it's cut through by the third element, which is masses of carbonation. And this is why people think that beer makes you really gassy, because the level of carbonation that is actually in a lot of our sort of widely drunk beers. You, you drink a can of Coke, and that stuff is mostly carbon dioxide. It's kind of similar with these macro beers. So rather than having bitterness, which is, you know, could potentially put people off, people that haven't drunk a lot of bitter stuff or eaten a lot of bitter stuff in their lives will potentially perceive it as poison and that's why kids are like oh or certain people that don't haven't drunk beer for a long time are like oh so instead of bitterness we've got we've got we've got barrel loads we've got tanker loads of carbonation that creates that crisp carbonic bite which replaces the bitterness so even though i would not consider this a balanced beer whatsoever it's very very sweet in the first two kind of segments it cleans up really 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 quickly because of that carbonic bite. And so say what you will about macro pilsners, and I will say what I will about macro pilsners and macro lagers. They are not balanced, but they are very, very well structured. And to me, that is why they have seen huge success. What does all this mean? Now I started this video by saying certain beers are nearly objectively better than others. That is based on my theory of structure, this idea that if the structure's there, and it is, I think, there in this beer, and certainly in these five beers, that there will be a large proportion of people that will really enjoy that beer. There are lots of beers out there that the beer geeks really, really, really enjoy, or certain sub subsects really, really love, but it's never gonna have broad appeal because that structure isn't there. I'm thinking of, you know, big pastry stouts of New England IPAs, these beers that get people very, very excited, but are actually too much for some people that lack a bit of structure, lack a bit of, you know, kind of 
almost cognitive thought that went into it. It was like, let's just go as big as we possibly, possibly can and not worry too much about structure. And that's fine. That's exciting. I drink a lot of those beers. But in terms of objectively being better, for a beer to potentially objectively be better, it must have that structure. And I think that all of the great beers in the world are underpinned by this three three destination journey that you go on the start the middle and the finish all of which offer different things and use the four incredible ingredients that we have in beer to ensure that that structure and ultimately that drinkability is there i'd love to hear your thoughts on this theory i think i'm going to get some hate in the comments but i really do think that balance is an unhelpful way to describe beer and i do think that structure is a much better way to do it so let me know how you look at beer uh, make sure that you join us for our kernel live show where maybe i'll raise this with the brewers um, and of course, join our Patreon, where in our Discord forum, we are having lots of conversations equally as geeky as this, but also lots of much, much less geeky conversations and lots of silly gifts that are getting out of hand. Uh, cheers, guys. We'll see you next week.